especially in today's higher interest rate environment, especially when you've got a mortgage for the first time and you're experiencing all of the joys of servicing a mortgage, you know, month in, month out, making sure that you've got control and discipline over your money management system, I think is is absolutely critical. And that goes hand in hand with the first dot point that we were talking about, about having a household budget. Welcome to 360 Money Matters, where financial planners, Billy and Andrew, talk all things financial planning. This podcast aims to increase your knowledge and confidence with all things money. Each week, they will cover topics such as investing, cash flow, budgeting, saving, passive income, debt management, and much more, so you can live a life on your terms without limits. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the 360 Money Matters podcast. I'm Billy and I'm joined by my co-host, Andrew. Bills, good morning. Here we are back again for another episode. Andrew, back again in the hot seat in front of the mics, bringing lots of value to our listeners and our viewers. And this one's a little bit of a different one. We've got uh, a question in from a regular listener that we're going to talk through it it's just information. It's not advice. So we need to put that out there. Yeah. But um, look, I think this is really timely because we're starting to see a fair bit of, of this happen. And um, yeah, I reckon there'll be a lot of value in it today for uh, for everybody who's listening and watching. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the question, Bill? So this is a question from Danielle. So thank you, Danielle. Really appreciate it. But uh, she says, hi, guys. Love the podcast and thanks for the information. I've just... Sold- just, just finish it there. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> So, hi guys, love the podcast and thanks for the information. I just settled on my first property and mortgage and want to consider what are some of the practical next steps. That's a that's that's a good one. I it's, like it. It's a really it's a it's a good one, and I'll tell you why I think it's a good one is because I remember when I kind of went through it for the first time. You're putting so much uh, time, energy, and effort into you know getting your deposit up, finding the house, going through all of that you know, process that you go through looking on the weekends, smashing through realestate.com, and then you finally get there and you're like, oh, great, that's great. I've been saving for this thing. It's been such a big goal of mine. Now what? Yeah. Yeah, it's... (laughs) It's, um, I mean, I had a, a really similar experience. You, you put so much time, effort and energy into something that's so big and then once it's finished, you're kind of like, okay, well, what am I, what am I meant to do next? You, you're a bit lost in the lurch and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to unpack that a little bit today. I kind of think, and I don't know why my mind's gone here. Maybe I need another coffee. Maybe I'm going to miss the mark <laughs> completely and offend everybody here. But it's like I used to have a dog and if you had the front door open and the car went past, he'd chase the car, right? Yeah. He never caught it. So it's like you catch the car and he's like, what do you do now? What do you do now? (laughs) Yeah, sort of. I don't know. Anyway, that's just how my brain works. Andrew, what's the first thing that we think about after we, um, after we settle on a property? Look, first thing that you think about is your your household budget. I mean, things have changed Mm -hmm. and there's an assumption, not an assumption, but Danielle, you know, if you've purchased a, a property, it's your first property, your first mortgage, you've either, you know, come from living at home with parents, and not having the expenses of a household or not having the entirety expenses of a household or you've come from renting and there's been some expenses in the form of rent but you know all of your maintenance all of your you know renovations all of the other things that uh, that you haven't needed to worry about before mm-hmm. and now there and you need to make sure that you're accounting for it in your budget um, and so the first first step is basically redoing your your budget and accounting for all of the things that you didn't expect um, or that you didn't have previously and, you know, accounting for some of the other things that will hopefully reduce some of the expenses and um, and maybe there's some uh, some reduction in some of the expenses to, to balance it out as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I found interesting in my experience um, purchasing a property is probably the unexpected cost that you'll spend on stuff that you didn't anticipate. So you look at a house and you go, yeah, that's fantastic. I love this about the property or whatever it may be. And then you go there and you're like, okay, yep, I was thinking in the lounge room, I'm going to do this, but hang on a sec, actually, I want to change something different. And there's an, a vacant spot there. Let's go buy a couch. There's enough, you know, all of these sorts of things come up out of left field. So redoing your numbers after you're in, because you would have done them yeah. beforehand, no doubt, but redoing your numbers after you're in, once you've got, I guess, the reality of what it's like living in that space and then also any additional expenses that you wouldn't necessarily have incurred beforehand if you're renting or living at home with uh, with your parents or whatever it may be, 
definitely knowing your numbers is absolutely critical because, you know, servicing a mortgage is a really big commitment and you don't want to get that wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, consider things that you otherwise wouldn't have considered or otherwise wouldn't have worried about um, that you can't necessarily plan for or know exactly what it's going to be. Like at some stage, there's going to be a water leak. At some stage, something is going to need some form of repair. And so putting some money aside for that is is really wise, which sort of comes into the the next step, which is, you know, making sure that you've got a, a cash flow management strategy bills. Yeah, and look, just going back a step as well too, I tend to find that uh, I'm visiting Bunnings pretty much every week <laughs> weekend and I swear when I bought my place, there was nothing to do, <laughs> right? Yeah. So just put an allocation in your bucket, in your budget for um, <laughs> for, time. <laughs> for going to uh, for going to Bunnings because uh, it does come out of left field. And um, yeah, back to, back to the podcast and what we're talking about. So the cash flow system, we've been talking about the importance of having a cash flow and banking um, system in place, a strategy in place how you think about allocating your funds, how you think about tracking it, how you set that up so you're not overspending, um, you're not experiencing any leakage. What does that look like? I think when, you know, especially in today's higher interest rate environment, especially when you've got a mortgage for the first time and you're experiencing all of the joys of servicing a mortgage, you know, month in, month out, making sure that you've got control and discipline over your money management system, I think is is absolutely critical. And that goes hand in hand with the first dot point that we we're talking about, about having a household budget. Yeah. So in other words, I mean, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not enough to just do a budget because if you don't have a system in order to make sure that you adhere to that budget, then basically a budget is just a piece of paper of you estimating what things are you know, going to look like without an actual strategy on making sure that it does pan yeah. out that way. It's kind of like going to see a personal trainer and getting a plan done and not actually, not go, actually you know, not having a schedule time. to go to the gym to, to do it. Yeah. So I talk about all of these gym analogies and stuff now because I've started training <laughs> yeah, and exactly working out right. a little bit. So hopefully everyone can see that <laughs> if you're watching it on uh, on video on YouTube. So I just thought I'd throw that in because I'm an expert now, apparently. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's thrown me. Um, <laughs> all right. So you've built a, a cash flow strategy. You've built a, a budget. Um, and, and with that cash flow strategy, while we're on it, I mean, we've got our own cash flow boot camp that we take our clients through. And I think that's, yeah, <clears throat> probably one of the most empowering work that we actually do. Um, but one of the other things that's, that's really important when you've purchased your, your first property, normally when you're purchasing a property, and, you know, I was the same and, and everyone is usually, you know, in a similar boat when it comes to this. You set a particular budget, you know that it's comfortable, you know, it's auction day or a real estate agent's calling you and, you know, an extra five, 10, 15 grand is going to get it over the line. And so you push yourself, you push yourself and all of a sudden what was going to be a, you know, rainy day fund that you're going to have at the end of settling the property is now a zero cash balance and all of a sudden you've you know stretched yourself to to get into that yeah. perfect property so building that rainy day fund is really important and getting that back on track and building that into your cash flow mm -hmm. strategy is um is super important because you you tend to stretch yourself as much as you can to to get the right place and making sure that uh, that you're, you're realigning yourself back into having cash flow buffers, back into having all of the uh, the important things if things were to, you know, go wrong, that uh, that you're building that back up again. Yeah, and I guess that ties into the, you know, previous couple of points that we were making around, you know, your expenses will go up because there's, there's stuff there that you haven't been used to experiencing before. Um, you may move into the property and then realise that, hey, you need to, you need to deck it out with some furniture or whatever it may be that you didn't expect. There might be some unplanned maintenance. And you're right, the real estate agents are very good at getting that extra, I don't even know what we'll call it, that extra 1% out of out of everybody. And all of a sudden, you know, where there was no interest in the property, when you're about to sign, there's just that little bit more interest. So we can we can bump that up a bit. Um, so yeah, having that there and, and knowing what that looks like and going back to our cash flow system, we've got some numbers that we use, rules of thumb essentially, basically saying, okay, this is your household composite, how much you should have as an emergency fund, as a buffer, as a float in your accounts. Um, and we build that into the programs that, uh, that we run. But one of the really simplistic things I think with your buffers um, and your savings that you've got is, especially when you've got a mortgage, I've seen this so many times that people have that money 
in a savings account, not in their offset account. And I, I just don't know if it's just an oversight or you know just a lack of knowledge or whatever it may be. But if you put it in your in your offset account, it won't change your contracted repayments. They will stay the same, but the percentage split inside the repayment of what you pay on principal versus what you pay on interest will change. Meaning if you've got money in the offset, you will pay off your contracted repayment more principal and less interest, which is what you want. Yeah, yeah. So basically if you've got savings, keep it in your offset account, particularly an owner-occupied property. But if you've got money that um, that you're putting away, particularly when it's a, a larger amount of money, have it in your offset account because, yeah, as you say, I've seen it so many times with, you know, not people that have even purchased their first property but are even at, you know, property two, three yeah, yeah. Uh, and so on that have money in savings when really your savings rate for the vast majority of people is far lower than what you're getting from an interest rate in, in having money in the offset account. Yeah, I guess in a really simplistic sense, yes, that's the case. And we're going to talk about wealth creation a little bit further in the uh, in the podcast. But if it's savings versus in an offset account, offsetting debt that you've got, um, I think that's a no-brainer, no yeah. doubt about it. But hold that thought because we are going to talk about yeah. uh, some wealth creation um, strategies when it comes to you know thinking about your um, your family home as well too. Yeah. Um, Andrew, what else? I think a big one is probably the protection piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, risk mitigation is is the next kind of massive thing because yeah. when there's a mortgage, there's basically there's an asset and there's either a family unit or yourself personally that you want to make sure that you can protect if something were to go wrong. So what we're talking about here is get some life insurance, you know, touch wood, something happens. Yep. What do you want to see happen to that yep. property? Do you want that property to be passed on to kids? Do you want that property to be passed on to a spouse? Do you want them to inherit debt and also inherit the asset but then need to move out of that property yep. and sell it if you were to pass away? Look at permanent disability cover. What happens if you're unable to or, or likely to never return to work? Do you want to also have a mortgage that's hovering over you and then be forced into a position where you need to sell the property? Yep. Um, and in the short term, and I don't want to say more importantly because it's they're all just as important as each other, but income protection insurance. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's big things that can happen that can have a really detrimental impact to yourself, to yeah, yourself and your family. But what happens if you're temporarily unable to work because you're sick or injured? These are things that happen all the time. People need to take, you know, three months off work, yeah. six months off work because of the fact that they're sick, injured and unable to work. What happens? There's still mortgage repayments that are still yeah. going to be coming out. It's not as easy to just move out of a rental property, go back with mum and dad because if you're doing that in a property as opposed to or when you own a property as opposed to renting, you don't just break yeah. lease and move. You now all of a sudden need to find new tenants. You need to move all of your yeah. stuff out. Yeah. It's a much longer process. And so making sure that you've got adequate insurance covers, making sure that you've got life insurance, permanent disability, income protection, trauma insurance, just having a, a real risk strategy in order to make sure that sick, injured, can't yeah. work, everything still continues as normal and you can have what you'd like to see happen. I mean, for some people, they want to pay off the entirety of the mortgage. Yep. For other people, it's not important. They just want, you know, an amount of money that's going to be there for someone to buy themselves some time until they make some decisions on the property. But build the strategy that's right for you in order to be able to make sure that what you'd like to see happen is actually what happens in the event that something were to something negative yep. were to occur. Yep. And look, that's the that's the reality of life. That stuff just happens. And I guess part of what we're talking about in terms of, you know, acquiring more assets and building wealth and, and the like, it just forms or should form part of your overall thinking when it comes to creating and managing your wealth. And part of that process has to have a risk strategy attached to it. Um, the other one that I want to call out as well, too, is just making sure that you've got your, you know, your building and your contents insurance um, sorted out as well, too. So your building insurance in case you know, something happens to the building, I don't know, a tree falls down or something like that, um, you've got that covered. Uh, generally speaking, when you're taking out a mortgage, you're going to have the, the lender, <clears throat> the lender is, is going to, um, going to need you to get a certificate of an insurance policy, um, over the top of that property 
just to protect their interest in it because obviously they've lent you the money against that property. So making sure that you've got good comprehensive insurance in the event that something should happen because it's not just, hey, I've got, you know, the keys to the door now. I can make the repayments fantastic. Um, you know, you need to think about those other things and that ties into to what you were talking about with the insurance as well. And probably the other one that I just want to call out that I've seen, there's a bit of a misconception out there, I think, in terms of the products that are available, but you hear that some lenders offer mortgage insurance. And this is not the lender's mortgage insurance when you purchase based on your loan to value ratio. This is when you take out a mortgage with a particular lender and they say, oh, we're going to give you, you know, income protection, they call it, for a period of three months and we'll add a, a premium onto your uh, your repayments each and every month and away you go. When I've sort of looked under the bonnet with these things, what it is is not income protection in the sense that if you are unable to work, your income is being paid to you. What these policies are, they're just designed to pay your mortgage, usually for a period of three months. Yeah. So it's like a repayment holiday, which if you were experiencing financial distress, you could request off the bank anyway, and they have to do it as part of the banking covenants. But it's there to protect them in terms of the repayments. It doesn't give you any additional money to run your life over yeah. the top of that. So you'd still, in, in an event where it's significant enough and you thought you were covered for X, you're actually covered for Y in this instance with these products. So I just wanted to call it out because I've seen so many people that I've spoken to, they think that they've got sort of yeah. income protection, then you talk them through it and it's just like they go white as a ghost. Yeah. 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 So understand what it is that you're getting yourself into and make sure that you're receiving some good quality advice off the back of it. Yeah. Andrew, next one. Next one is... Setting the new goal. I mean, and this ties into the the future wealth creation plan. This ties into some debt elimination strategies. This ties into wealth accumulation strategies. So this is a, a little bit that we'll we'll sort of talk through. But what's the next goal? What are you trying to achieve if you don't have it already? So for some people purchasing that first property, like Danielle, if you've been listening to our podcast, you've purchased your first property. That probably is a step in, yep. you know a bunch of other um, wealth creation objectives. The first and step in the dance, Andrew. Exactly the right. the <laughs> first step in the dance. What about that? So you've taken the first step and so there's already a bunch of other things that uh, that this was purely a step in, in helping to facilitate. But what's the next step? What's the next thing that you're trying to do? Is it, and there's a million different ways that you can dice this up and it could do a podcast on this topic alone, but... What, what's the strategy? Are you just pumping everything into the offset account, trying as hard as you can to pay off the mortgage and that's it? And if that's the case, then what's the next step after that? Yeah. Yeah. Are you apportioning part of your money towards paying down the mortgage and a part of your money towards wealth accumulation? Are you looking to snowball equity into the property and potentially yeah. add renovations to draw equity out? to be able to purchase the next investment property. I mean, what are you trying to achieve and how does this property fit into the broader wealth creation strategy? Yeah, I mean, look, that's that's so broad in itself and I probably want to just share some of my own personal experiences in this regard. I think it'll articulate it quite nicely. I remember when we got our first mortgage and the thing on my mind is you go and borrow all of this money and hundreds of thousands of dollars and all of a sudden you're making these repayments per month and what have you. And it's like, I just had this mindset and I think it might have come from my background, you know, being European background and all that sort of stuff is you just get, no matter what, you just get rid of your mortgage as quickly as you can. Yeah. And I think that strategy may have worked, well, definitely worked, but I think it was a lot more powerful um, and a lot more easier to execute maybe back in the day when mortgages weren't as, hu as high as what they are today. But I remember that when we first got our mortgage, that was, that was it for me. It's like, okay, how do I get this thing down as quickly as I can? And I remember one year, and I did quite well. It was in the first year. I paid $300 a week extra in principal repayments on my mortgage. So that's that's huge. It's fifteen thousand dollars, right? Back extra. In the, back in the seventies, when Billy was buying his first property, that's yeah, basically for, for paying what, 15, off the first property for fifteen hundred bucks. I bought the uh, <laughs> the property, right? But um, Andrew, I told you, forever thirty nine, right? <laughs> um, so I remember in that first year, I paid an extra fifteen thousand dollars, which was huge, and I busted my my neck in order to do that, and we cut back on our lifestyle and all of those sorts of things. And then I looked at the statement, and I'm like. 
it's great. It's gone down by 15,000 and that's a huge achievement. Don't get me wrong. And I say this, I say this in the right context, but it was only 15,000. And I'm like, if I sustain that, one, I'm going to kill myself and two, what does it then look like if I cast that out? The reason why I'm sharing that is because I think that's still the mindset of a lot of people. And when and, and there's nothing wrong with that strategy because there's a lot of comfort associated with having less debt. But I've learned over the years that it's about your cash flow to be able to continue servicing the debt. So if I don't have cash flow, as an example, if my income falls over or something happens, I get sick or injured, touch wood, whether I've got a $250,000 mortgage, a $500,000 mortgage, the debt level doesn't actually matter. It's my ability to make the repayments continuously that matters. Yes, the repayments on a smaller debt are easier to make than the bigger debt because the number is, is smaller. But that was my thinking back then. Now when we look at it, most of the time we start talking about, yep, we've got a debt elimination strategy, which where my mind went originally versus a wealth accumulation strategy. So which way do you go? And there's no right or wrong, Andrew. I'm going to throw over to you for a sec to share some of your experiences. But in that context, it was amazing how my mind automatically went to one way where in our experience as financial advisors, that's not necessarily the right and only and or only way. Andrew, yeah. you want to share some of your experiences with that? I mean, look, similar similar story with me in that the first property that I purchased, exactly the same story, pay off as much as you can. Um, we actually rented out the property for the first, I think, two years um, after purchasing, so we were still living at home. And again, the focus was pay off as much as you can, put as much as you can towards the property, and, and that's it. And what you hopefully realize um and i've been fortunate to work in the industry that i work in and see some other ways of doing things is that okay you can put everything everything you can towards paying off this mortgage and eventually what's going to happen is the mortgage is going to be expunged and maybe that takes you 20 years instead of 30 years but then what's next because i still haven't actually fulfilled any of my retirement goals and i use retirement yes. in, in italics because you're still young and you're not ready to retire but you still haven't actually made a step towards your retirement goals because that property is not generating an income from you yep. it's not helping yep. facilitate your retirement and so some of the other ways to to think about things is okay yes paying off debt and paying off mortgage is important and so as advisors and as we're giving advice in our experience to, to clients, it's sure, paying off your mortgage is an important step in the process. But another important step in the process is building your wealth and accumulating greater wealth in order to facilitate retirement at some point in time. So it's not a question of debt elimination yep. versus wealth yep. creation. It's purely what I look at it at is a, you're looking at a seesaw and what's the strategy going to be in, okay, is it going to be 50-50? 50% 50 50 yeah, yeah. of your you know cash flow is going to go towards one or the other. Is it going to be 75-25? Is it going to be, I mean, pick whichever number suits you and is comfortable for you and your personal situation and work towards that. And then you start realizing and considering, okay, well, I can pump everything that I can towards this mortgage. Or alternatively, you know, I can use some of the money to put renovations yeah. into the property that's going to add value, draw equity out of that property to purchase another yeah. property, have that be, you know, maybe cash flow neutral or not require much funds and get a rental <coughs> income coming in, sell one of the properties at a future point in time, and then all of a sudden I've got, you know, a... 10-year or 10-year debt-free um, plan as opposed to a 20-year debt-free plan. Now, that's, you know, really simplistic strategy and doesn't yep, account yep. for a whole bunch of different things. But what you then realize is there's a million different ways to do it, but have a strategy, understand why you're doing it and where you're heading towards. And if that strategy is to change in the future, you know, what you think may be your forever home now may not be your forever home in five or 10 years time. That's fine. You readjust the strategy yeah. then. Yep. If everybody 
followed Andrew on that one. Fantastic. If they didn't, what he said with all of that is that it's complicated and you need to get advice because I think really yeah. that's the crux of it because if if you consider, say, a time frame, you purchase a house, if you're age 30, you've got a 30-year time frame, you're looking at age 60 by the time you pay it off. If you pay it off you know, in 10 years earlier, you're now 50, you've got 10, 15 years left of your working career. How do you build up assets to generate enough yeah. wealth to provide retirement income for you down the track and there's never there's never one straightforward answer i think you know getting advice we're big advocates of that obviously what we do for a living but um andrew i think that was a really good uh, really good summary of of yeah the experience that we see and usually the course of action that we take when it comes to hey do i pay off debt or do i do something else it's yeah it's usually a combination of a, a few different things but just recapping so Danielle, thank you for the uh, for the question. Purchase the property. What should I do next? Uh, redo a budget, cash flow system, rainy day fund. Um, if you've got money laying around, obviously in your offset account as opposed to savings, look at your insurances from your risk plan. And then what do you do next? Debt elimination, wealth creation. It's never usually either or. It's, uh, sorry, either. It's usually or, or sorry, and. Um, so we do bits and pieces and start thinking about the next step and the next goal because it's it's I don't think it's just as straightforward as got the property and not done. Yeah, absolutely. And get advice. And get advice. Yeah. Bills, thank you very much for uh, for another podcast and thanks again to, to all of our viewers and our listeners for tuning in. If you got some value out of that, like, subscribe. And if you've got any questions um, like Danielle, feel free to, to shoot it through to either Billy or myself. Details are in the show notes. Thanks. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions on what we talked about or would like to have a chat about your money journey, visit us at 360fs.com.au. Just a reminder to our listeners that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature and is not intended as personal recommendations for the audience. Please consider whether the information suits your circumstances before acting on it. This information is provided by Billy Amaridis and Andrew Nicolou of 360 Financial Strategists Petrarchy Limited, authorised representatives and credit representatives of AMP Financial Planning.